Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone fled to thy protection, implore thy help, or sought thy intercession, or was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To thee do we come before thee we stand, visible and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. Lord, guide our minds and hearts to the ups and downs of this life. To you who are all, lead us in the path of simplicity and humility. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Saint Dominic. Praise us. Saint Catherine of Siena. Praise uh, us. Saint Angela Foligno. Praise us. Adelaide of Antwerp. Praise us. Saint John Paul II. Praise us. In the name of the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> You might have noticed, I, uh, so I prayed to St. Antipolino. Okay, that's obvious enough. Um, I didn't pray to Margaret of Peretti. <laughs> um, and I didn't pray to Mechtod of Magburg. Um, I think Mechtod of Magburg is uh, closer to uh, being prayed to worthy. <laughs> uh, but it had her command for I think she was saintly. So I prayed to her. Yeah, so we'll, um, I just want to say something, okay, so before we get into Margaret of, of Perret, um, you know, a lot, a theme that's come up a lot with these, uh, women mystics begins is this theme of abandonment by God and a sense of desolation and in dealing with that. And I just wanted to just begin by noting why they stress it so much. And it's not that they're kind of dour or something or overly focused on negative things in life. But that it is sort of often like a crisis, right? You, you start this uh, a fervent relationship with the Lord. Uh, there tends to be consolations early on. You're, you're drawn to the Lord. And then all of a sudden something happens. You get to religious life, right? It all tries up. <laughs> and so it is, I mean, it is a real crisis uh, for for people, for us. Yeah, how do you deal with things in your prayer life when they change? And uh, the times of brightness and consolation are changed, or they shift, there are times of desolation. How do we deal with that? You know, it's a common theme in people's lives. And so uh, they're caught up in this as well. And it is um, a, a crisis at times that can make or break people. Uh, that's often why people leave monasteries. You know, they come here. Um, and then after some months, it's like, well, what's happened? I can pray better out there than I can pray in here. Um, and so people leave. And so it's not appreciating how God uses the dryness, the aridity, and the darkness, and it is part of that journey with Him. Uh, and obviously, you know, people, some <laughs> leave the monastery, it's a good discernment, um, but for people who leave for bad reasons, this probably is the issue, all right? They had these consolations and prayers, and maybe going so well before they come to the monastery, and it's not what happened. And uh, not just that one-time thing, but it's a, a persistent problem or problem or issue in the spiritual life. And it's not just, that, okay, one day we get the answer for it and we're like, okay, so I figured that out. I read John Cross on the dark night. I see how it all works together in God's plan. For those who love God, all things work together for good. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through that and I can move <laughs> on. Uh, no, it stays with us through life, the spiritual life. What's going on now, Lord? How do I handle this? And so, as you get into the experience of the spiritual life, it is a key dynamic. And these begins, who are very attentive 
to kind of experience and kind of, you know, more the affective side of the soul as well. They're very attentive to desolation and consolation. And they started life, right, with all this fervor. You know, these Begin women, right, they, they begin with all this fervor, much light and consolation from the Lord. And then, so it is going to be like a big striking, like, oh, what is happening now? And how do they deal with this? So it is a great insight of theirs to see this, okay, not simply as this is a trial to help me, my soul grow and for my heart to expand and for my love to go get, grow stronger and pure, uh, but to see that um, this is also part of my living out the mystery of Christ's life, his desolation on the cross. He lived in exile. You know, so Hadowick speaks about this as... Um, God becoming man and living in exile in his humanity, even to the point of the cross. And we have to live too, uh, in the incarnate, we have to live the mystery of Christ, God and man, and also his exile. We hear in Angela Foligno, this game of love, uh, you know, God pushes her far away, draws her close, this back and forth. And she sees it, you know, as a share in God, uh, Christ, cry on the cross. So she says, my son, my son, speaking of Christ, why have you forsaken me? That kind of thing. And seeing this all as a share in Christ's passion and his poverty, contempt, suffering. And she bears invisibly in a way, right? The stigmata of Christ, just like Francis did. And we see it in uh, Margaret of Peretti. She uses this theme of near and far. This game of near and far. Sometimes we feel near to God. Sometimes we feel far. To see it as part of uh, God's uh, plan. And who am I forgetting here? Oh, Mechthard of Magburg. Oh, yeah, so we just saw yesterday, blessed estrangement. <coughs> so this sense of estrangement from God, seeing it as a blessed thing. Right, so that's kind of what they're, a key move they make, the alchemy <laughs> that they're doing. Uh, they turn what we're like, be something that we want to avoid and we see as bad um, and to like, wow, oh no, this is God is at work here. Blessed estrangement. Um, this is a blessed state to be in. And um, there is nearness with the Lord because you're near to the Lord Jesus in his, all the mysteries of his life, including the sorrowful. Or Hadowick, you know, all the modes of love. Yeah, this is love. This is a storm of love I'm going through. And the Lord is here and he's doing something with it. And it, it's love that's behind it and that's in it. That uh, is the, the end of it as well. So to have us kind of transition to that Copernicum revolution or something, or just a new kind of different way of seeing things, uh, texts like these can help us to do that, to move into that that place. You know, we know the principles or we can know the principles, but that, that doesn't <laughs> solve kind of the nitty gritty of day to day life. And, um, yeah, having to deal with uh, desolation and difficulty at times in the life of prayer. So with the Beguines, it has this new accent on this, on this, um, experience and what to make of it and how to deal with this, this crisis, um, from day one to, day uh, and <laughs> and then the Ryland mystics pick up this theme and emphasis and emphasize it in a strong way too Henry Suso John Powler and then um, from John Powler uh, it gets taken up in John on the Cross and then onwards you know the classic treatment of the dark nights of the soul and John on the Cross too you know links it to Christ's cry on the cross a sent um Book two, chapter seven, he has kind of a description of the dark night of the census and soul where he links it to Christ's cry on the cross. So the Beguines are all background to that. I think of Andrew Foligno, influences Teresa of Avila. So yeah, so that's why there's this emphasis on this blessed estrangement in ways that these texts can be helpful for us. Okay, so um, getting into Margaret of Peretti now, our last one, which will, which will be shorter than the other ones. So it was only in 1947 
that um, scholars linked this text, the Mirror of Simple Souls, uh, to this figure who was burned at the stake in uh, 1310, Margaret of Peretti. So for a while, you know, in the manuscript tradition, like I mentioned before, the, the Carthusian monasteries would read this text a lot and they kept the manuscript tradition going in a strong way. But they had no idea for those centuries that there was a heretic there to be. <laughs> that she was burned at the stake. Uh, so it's only in 1947 where a scholar sees, you know, makes the link together. Oh, that this this is this is the same person it was burned at the stake in 1310 who wrote this text. I mean, it never had a wide dissemination this text, um, but you know, for centuries, they, people didn't realize who the author was. So Margaret of Peretti, uh, born probably around 12, 1250, and she dies 1310. And then you know, a year or two later, there's that council, which takes a strong stance against the Beguines. So it's all kind of coming together here um, in this movement against the Beguines. And they continue on after this, but um, it does kind of deflate the movement a bit. It's interesting, so Margaret of Peretti, she was the first person the church ever burned at the stake or executed for heresy in the Western church, I think is what, he, uh, what it says. Um, so that starts, um, I guess, a, you know, a sad chapter in our uh, the history of the, the church. Uh, unless you're so go Dominican that... <laughs> You want to defend the Inquisitors. I mean, yeah, the Inquisitors are often more um, merciful than earthly rulers. Anyways, so, but yeah, so she's the first in the Western Church, first heretic burned at the stake, and then the more uh, follow after her. I mean, other people were burned at the stake, but not for, for heresy, I suppose. So uh, the big theme of Margaret of Peretti, and again, so with, with her, just like the others, so just like Padawick and Mechtild, we know nothing really about Margaret's life except what appears in her own writings and her account of things. And we know, you know, the end months of her life, just from the, the trial, you know, there must be um, transcripts, many transcripts from the the heresy trial and so forth. And, you know, during the trial, she just remained silent. She didn't defend herself or um, recant. And so uh, they took her as um, an unrepentant uh, heretic. And people were still edified. There were some people present uh, for the, um, the execution. Who note she showed many noble and devout signs of penance at her death, by which the feelings of many were moved to heartfelt compassion for her, even to tears, as eyewitnesses who saw it testified. So her text is the mirror of simple souls, and in fact the full title uh, is this. The mirror of simple, annihilated souls and those who remain only in will and desire of love. <laughs> but that gives that gets at kind of the, the main theme of her text. The mirror of simple, annihilated souls and those who remain only in will, who remain only in the will and desire of love. Really becoming you know, all love, all that remains there is love. So this word annihilated gets us into a peculiar theme uh, that's big with the Beguines. As you might remember when we started, one of the three key characteristics of the Beguines is this theme of annihilation. Um, and so it goes, you know, so the courtly love motifs, um, the madness of love, the excess of love, um, passionate love, and then annihilation is another key theme. So we might be just quick to like dismiss this uh, annihilation talk, um, but to appreciate what they're they're getting at, and to appreciate how um, nothingness 
is sort of a theme in the mystical tradition, even among, you know, orthodox uh, thinkers. So think of St. John the Cross. Uh, God is the toto, the all. But to get to the toto, you need to go the path of the nada. Nada, nada, nada. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Up the ascent, not this, not that. And so it is a, a theme in the mystical tradition, even among orthodox um, spiritual writers. It gets picked up right in Catherine of Siena as well. I am he who is, you are she who is not. So there's something humbling about this theme, that this nothingness of the soul in itself, uh, the increased nothingness to our sinfulness, and in comparison yeah, to God, whereas nothing and he is the all. And there is a sense of, yeah, the more we embrace our nothingness, the more the all, <laughs> that is God, um, can take over and we're in union with him. So I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm going to try to sketch, um, uh, like I've done in the other ways, some of these teachings of Margaret and the other Beguines, um, that we can, might quickly want to just dismiss as like silliness or, or sort of something else. Um, just to try to open up the inner reason behind it or what they're getting at or why it was so attractive, why it was so influential, why it was helpful to a certain extent. And there are exaggerations, but to appreciate that there is kind of an inner nugget that gets taken up by other um, Christian mystics as well who are very orthodox. <laughs> so the, this theme of nothing is, is very much a theme of, of simplicity, the nakedness of the soul, being stripped of kind of all the extras. There's a story of St. Therese as she's kind of becoming a uh, novice mistress or assistant novice mistress, but, or I think, was she novice mistress or assistant? Like assistant. 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 One of the novices comes to her uh, one day and says, you know, Sister Therese, um, you know, I see kind of where I am now and I just have so much I need to, to, to gain in the spiritual life. So far to go. And then St. Therese says, to gain? Uh, you mean to lose. Uh, you have so much to, to lose, to let go. Uh, the complications to... To you know, to let go of that—that's how you advance in the spiritual life. So that's what I'm saying, Therese, and that is very much along this this theme of of nothingness, being stripped of this or that thing, all these complications in our life. Think about in our our minds and hearts, we have all these alien loves, these alien concerns, these things that weigh on us, uh, that get in the way of our relationship with the Lord. Useless fear. Useless anxiety. And so these kind of cloud us and they are um, a barrier in a way between us and the Lord. And so to be stripped of all that, to let all that go, to enter into nothingness where kind of all that disappears uh, can be a place of like entering a greater intimacy with the Lord and union with the Lord. So, you know, it takes us as, you know, prudent, sharp Dominicans uh, to, to see, you know, when that kind of tactic is helpful in our own spiritual lives and when it's not, right? Because there are concerns of mind and heart that we should have on our mind and heart. You know, if you have a responsibility, uh, we do have to, or your prioress or your novice mistress, there are things you have to be occupied with. But as we all know, at some point, what becomes reasonable in our paying attention to things and what becomes reasonable crosses a line where it becomes excessive, and we're overly preoccupied uh, with this or that concern, this or that duty, this or that worry. And so then to be able to like utilize uh, some of these like writings of the saints on the nada, on the nothingness, and to, to help that to let go, help us help that help, use that to help us let go of some of these things. Right, a lot of these texts in the spiritual tradition are not just stating facts, they're not just stating principles. Um, it is more of a, a rhetoric <coughs> that's helping to bring us to a certain place, kind of in spiritual disposition, spiritual attitude, spiritual stance. So then, you know, St. Catherine's, um, I am he who is, you are she who is not. Right, metaphysically it's not true. 
and we do, we do have like creative being. Uh, but it is helpful when we are kind of puffed up, when we are struggling with pride, when we think it all uh, counts on me. It's so helpful to enter into that. Yeah, God is he who is. I am he who is not. And it brings us to that place of humility. So the, these texts contain a certain rhetoric, a, a certain way of moving us to a certain place. Um, not just giving us principles, but bringing us, because um, it's, you know, principles work great for just the intellect. Uh, but when you have a whole kind of emotional <laughs> a being and moods and um, habitual ways of responding to things, habitual dispositions, uh, to get those emotions kind of in line with the principles and with the truth can take some work. And uh, these, these texts that are so moving, poetic, uh, that impact us, kind of help us to, to get there uh, where we want to be. And so then the trick is to have you know, a prudent, clear mind and like, yeah, discern like when, when this is helpful, when it's not. When, when am I getting too caught up in this or that duty or this or that relationship? Right, if there's a relationship with, with another sister in the monastery that's just like consuming you, you come to the chapel, <laughs> you just can't break <laughs> away from it. <laughs> uh, at that time, it's good to hear John the Cross whisper in your ear, live in the monastery as if you were the only one there in the monastery. It's like, oh yeah, Lord, it's just you and me. I let go of that. And so you, then you, you take that principle in not as like, a universal, always applicable principle, live in the monastery just for the only one. <laughs> I'm not going to serve you supper tonight. <laughs> I'm not going to care about you at all. Um, no. Uh, John didn't intend that. I mean, he knows uh, the gospel of John well. <laughs> the teachings of Jesus, love God, love neighbor, he knows that. Uh, but these things are helpful to kind of get us when we are, when we're like overboard one way in our emotions and our, our dispositions to kind of Get, get, get us back, get us back to, to the middle place of virtue. <clears throat> so this, this theme of nothingness, annihilation, I mean, it's strong, strong language, um, but it, it's a place, that strong language helps move us to a certain place. And it, it's left to us to prudently use these texts and these ways of thinking to reach that um, center point. Right, John across uh, humility, perfect humility is being established in the center. Not to kind of lift it up, not to push down, but you find your center point, and that's humility. And yet to find that center point, we do have to use <laughs> nada, nada, nada. We have to enter into the nothingness, the nakedness of soul um, to get there. But we're ultimately aiming towards that center point. <clears throat> so annihilation, self-annihilation, is very much tied to uh, the theme of surrender in these writers. That radical surrender, abandonment to divine providence. So there is the, you know, the holy indifference, you know, whether you give me riches or poverty, health or sickness, you know, you're enough for me, Lord. Your love is enough for me. Isn't there a song? Puts Ignatius' prayer or something. But yeah, so to, so that's, that's at the heart too of what they mean by annihilation. The self is annihilated, your own preferences, uh, the old, you know, it's the death to self that Jesus speaks of. Whoever finds his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world, finds it, keeps it for eternal life. I think even the, you know, whoever finds himself, loses himself, whoever hates himself, that shows up in the gospel somewhere, whoever hates himself, finds himself. And it's, you know, that old man, the self-centered person, egoistic person, needs to be annihilated, needs to be done away with. <clears throat> So that's part of the driving force of their language of this uh, annihilation, this emptying of self. And so that's another one, you know, kenosis, Philippians 2, 
the Lord, you, you know, have in yourselves the mind, the phronos, or the, the attitude uh, that was in Christ Jesus, though he's in the form of God, he emptied himself. And something about um, this conceptual framework of annihilation that helps them to enter into that emptying of self. That God might fill them, emptying them of self, so that that might be totally surrendered to God's will. Meister Eckhart, one of his best work, I think, I mean, he has some really good sermons, but um, his work that he gave to Dominican brothers in his convent, it's on like resignation, I think it's called. It's about this absolute surrender. So he's picking up these themes and running with them, under their gospel themes as well. But he'll say things like, um, and then this is a way to union with God. And he says, if, if you have no more will, God's will like automatically has to take the place of your will. Nature abhors a vacuum, he says. And so if you have no will, God's will automatically has to take over. I mean, you can push that too far where it, it's, it doesn't, it's not true. Uh, but um, yeah, if you get rid of your self-will, God, it has to be God's will. Uh, it takes over and that's a place of intimacy with the Lord. Uh, the place of intimacy and union with the Lord is being in his will. So I mean, that's a, a, a key theme for all of them as well. Where is God found? He's found when you're in his will. Um, and when your, your self-will, I mean, certainly your self-will, your, your self-centered will, when that's annihilated, then it is God's will um, that you're in line with. And so there is that union with God. So, you know, this is more, I mean, it does, I mean, we have to cooperate with God's will. We have to, you know, living out the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, <laughs> requires a lot of action on our part. Uh, but there is, it is helpful when you have like a plan you have your own will in something, the way you wanted to see something turn out, and it doesn't happen, uh, then it's a good place to be annihilated in your own will. <laughs> and then God's, then you find God because his will shines through and you're surrendered to it. You're giving yourself to that. And so this, this surrender to God's will is a key thing, and that's a place of union with the Lord. Right, that, that's totally true and orthodox. It makes sense. And they, you know, and the other, so they do push it uh, far, though. I mean, you even think of the, you know, that treatise, self abandonment to divine providence. You know, that's quite, you know, strong language um, in itself self abandonment to divine providence. Um, Elizabeth of the Trinity speaks about kind of the annihilation of self so that Christ might live in her. The dying of self. But ourselves don't want to die, so we need the strong language of annihilation to kind of help get there. And in that place of nothingness, the all will shine through. So another place for this talk of annihilation and nothingness is especially in prayer as we grow deeper in prayer, right? It's more about God's action than ours. We're receptive to it. There's a passivity to that, to the Lord and his action. Not a passivity that's too premature, that comes too early. But um, when God begins to act, to let him have his way. And so this is another way that they push things far here, just like with respect to prayer and where God begins to act and take over and in our place is to receive um, and enter into that simplicity, that silence of soul, attentive to God. And so here's another place where the language of like the annihilation talk comes in. You know, Margaret will say things like, you know, if you act, God can't act or something or your acting gets annoyed. Um, so there are excesses and it is kind of preparing the way for quietism. So, you know, there's a heresy in the 16th, the 1700s where um, people were encouraged to enter into that passivity too soon, kind of on their own effort, where you are just kind of left with nothingness 
centering prayer kind of falls under this accusation sometimes still. And it can if it's pushed too far, but it could be used uh, in a more proper way as well. But this theme of annihilation, it's about, yeah, letting God work, God's work take over, especially in prayer, to abide in silence and the, the nothingness of yourself and to receive from the Lord. And so it's a way of helping you to enter into that silence, that letting go, that surrender, that um, letting the concerns of the world fall away. This language of nothingness helps you to get there. Margaret Peretti, I mean, one of the things she was condemned for was saying things like uh, virtue at some place becomes overcome into the nothing. And what she means is like the act of work um, in times of prayer, certain times of prayer where you are led into peace and solitude by the Lord, um, a general loving knowledge of God begins to take over in your heart. Um, then yeah, you're not working, uh, you're not putting effort uh, forward. And so they speak of, she speaks about that as like going beyond the virtues, <laughs> which gets her in trouble. <laughs> you know, as good Thomas, we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit to think through this. And the gifts are more receptive to the action of the Holy Spirit. And that, that you know, operating under the gifts of the Holy Spirit is like, it's, it's beyond the virtues. It's not opposed to the virtues. And we still live the life of virtue. And there are times where we need to put forth the effort and activity. Uh, but there are times where uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit take over and build on the virtues, but also take you kind of beyond the virtues. So Mara de Peretti has a schema of union with mediation through the life of the virtues, union without mediation, and then union without difference. And it's, it's kind of just an increasing kind of receptivity um, to the Lord's action. Um, you know, that's the best way to kind of interpret it. And I think that is what she's after. Uh, but it, it led to misunderstandings as well. You know, add to this, among the Beguines, uh, there were kind of moral excesses as well. And there were things like, well, yeah, being with the Lord and the way I live doesn't matter. Um, and so you, you add the way kind of the moral failures of some Beguines, uh, and then you add it to like texts like this that make it sound like you're going beyond the virtues. And then you see why the church is concerned. <laughs> For good reason. But this language of union through, with mediation, union without mediation, union without difference is taken up by Blessed John Roosbrook. And he does a good, better job of explaining it, elaborating it in a way that's, that is orthodox and doesn't lead to the, these excesses. <clears throat> One more thing about nothingness, the theme of, of nothing in the mystical tradition, is that, you know, Eckhart has lines about God, you know, being nothing. Um, and what he means by that um, is that, yeah, God is no thing. You know, literally nothing is no thing. God is not one thing among other things. Um, and so it is a way of emphasizing um, God as other. It's you know, a strong strand of, of apophaticism, apophaticism. Uh, God is, 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 is a nothing. He's not this or that thing we imagine. He's beyond all that. And so mystics um, like Eckhart and, and Peretti, um, and even Henry Suso, blessed Henry Suso in the place, um, speaks about, uh, you know, the ultimate contact with the Lord is, is contact with nothing. Um, but it, it's understood in this context of, apophaticism and God being beyond every other thing. And that is helpful, right? As to kind of help us get, get us beyond idols we have of God or images of God. A more pure encounter with God um, beyond these images or idols might feel like more like nothing <laughs> experientially at first. Uh, than it would other kind of encounters with God we might be used to. So it is drawing us into the hiddenness of God. So that that's the main theme, I would say, in Margaret of Peretti and some of these other, you know, and as they uh, get taken up by the Rhineland mystics. Um, 
Also loving without a why, not having a reason, uh, not needing a reason to love. Uh, living without a why is loving with the pure spontaneity of a child. Let's see, chapter 29, it says, uh, the soul has been re reduced to nothingness, has no concern for herself. In the nothing that gives her everything, she swims and bobs and floats in the divine peace and fruition without any movement in her interior or without any exterior work. She does do any exterior work, and this is quoting Margaret phrases from her. It is always without herself, because the work is God's work, in her, without her, for her sake. No work can encumber or bind her, for she has nothing of herself. She has given all freely without a why, without a reason, just for the sake of love, for she is the lady of the bridegroom of her youth. And another thing that Margaret goes far with is something we talked about yesterday, this and, and before, um, our exemplar, our eternal exemplar of ourselves and Christ and with united to God has been in God's mind from all eternity. And so um, partly how we get to union and then in this kind of approach is by stripping everything else away. Um, where all that's left is God's eternal idea of us and our union with him. And that place of simplicity, of nakedness, of being stripped of all else. So Margaret goes far in that direction as well. So here's one text along those lines. Yeah, so all, all I've been saying is, yeah, how you interpret her charitably. And what I do think really was the driving force um, in her spirituality. And she does, you know, fall into excesses and you know some of her phrases are rightly condemned even as you can appreciate kind of the inner spirit uh, her intention with them you know same with some of the other Beguines yeah some of it's exaggerated and um, but I think you know they were sincere Christians and I think um, there was great holiness among them so uh, so here's an example of kind of, okay, we see what she's getting at, but it's kind of, uh, it's too much. Um, so this is chapter 138 of The Mirror of Simple Souls, or for the fuller title, The Mirror of Simple Annihilated Souls, uh, Those Who Remain Only in the Will and Desire of Love. Okay, so nothing, nothing else but love, right? That's kind of one way to, to get at this too. Nothing else but love. Uh, great simplicity, perfect simplicity before the Lord, childlike simplicity. Uh, so chapter 138, now she, the soul, is in the being of her primordial being, which is her being. And she has left, uh, so she, lay, she had laid out three deaths that you have to pass through to get there in this annihilation. She has left the three deaths behind and made the two natures one. Uh, God and herself. When is that one? The one is when the soul is melted into the simple divinity, which is one simple being of spread out and diffused fruition and full knowing without feeling above the mind. That simple being does in the soul from charity whatever the soul does because the will has been made simple. Now such a soul is nothing. And so she is all things. Right? That kind of sounds like John the Cross, Nada, the, the Toto, nothing, and then the all. Now such a soul is nothing, and so she is all things. For she sees by means of the depth of understanding of her wretchedness, which is so deep and so great, that she finds there neither beginning nor end nor middle, only an ab abyssal abyss without bottom. There she finds herself without finding and without bottom. Um, yeah, you know, so I would say, you know, Margaret of Peretti, I read this book one time on, in college. It was part of our reading for this class I took on the Rhineland Mystics. Um, have I picked her up since for spiritual reading? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just, you know, just as you kind of think about how you might get into these people or, or not, um, certainly, you know, Angela Foligno, she's kind of the, her expression uh, is, is, is best at some of these themes. Then Hadowick of Antwerp, 
Um, so that was kind of, I would recommend them in that order, uh, those two. And then, okay, and then Mechtod of Magburg, if, you know, um, or Margaret of Peretti, then at the end. So, but those last two, I mean, if you don't get to them, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I, but I would recommend Saint, Andrew of Foligno, and then Hadowick of Antwerp. And even Hadowick of Antwerp, you need to be, just read her prudently and with your Dominican mind. <laughs> You'll be okay. <laughs> And she, she's more poetic. But some, I mean, these other texts, it is interesting to know Margaret of Freddy just because she did influence Meister Eckhart, and Eckhart read her. And you can see her, him taking themes, especially, you know, this loving without a why is a favorite theme of, of Meister Eckhart. You know, don't love because it's something you can get out of it. You know, don't love to impress the other person, but also don't love for a reward. A love without a why. Love without a reason. Just because you are loved, because uh, that's what it's all about. So there is great simplicity there. So I'll just read a few more texts of Margaret and then we can open up to questions. Margaret loves the dialogue, you know, reason dialoguing with the soul, love dialoguing with um, lady poverty, kind of things like that. So love says, now this soul says love, Oh, no. Let's do let's do this first. Okay, so this is the the far near talk. So we have blessed estrangement in Mechtod of Magburg. We have the double state of Christ's soul and Angelo Foligno, uh, the game of love. Um, we have, um, anyways, yeah. So different ways of expressing that. So this is, so the spouse of this, so the soul uh, is speaking and the spouse of the soul, which I guess is the Lord, says this. Okay, so the soul says, is there any wonder, says the soul herself, if before such a gift were given, I perceived it, I should myself be that which is given by that divine goodness. If my body had relinquished my soul, then he will give it to me forever. The spouse of the soul says this. This is not for her to do, says the spouse of the soul himself. I have sent you my pledges by my far near. But let no one ask me who is this far near, nor what are his works which he performs and works when he manifests the glory of the soul. For no one can say nothing of this except that far near is the very Trinity and makes this manifestation which we call movement to the soul. Not so that the soul should move or the Trinity, but the, tro- the, the Trinity makes this showing of its glory to the soul. No one is able to speak of this except only the deity himself. For the soul to whom this far near gives himself has such great knowledge from God, both of him and of all things, that she sees in God himself by divine knowledge. In the light of this knowledge takes from her the knowledge of God and of herself and of all things. So it gives an eye that also takes it away. Uh, it is true, says the soul, and there is nothing else. Now the soul is speaking. And therefore, if God wishes me to have such great knowledge, let him keep and prevent me from knowing him. All right, so we have this kind of paradoxical uh, light and darkness, knowing the unknowing that is a knowing. Or, you know, St. Paul even uses this language, Ephesians 3, uh, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowing, no, a knowing that surpasses knowing, St. Paul says. The mystics will speak about the knowing by unknowing. And here, um, and, or, um, Margaret says, if God wishes me to have such great knowledge, let him keep and prevent me from knowing him. For otherwise, says this soul, I should have no knowledge of him. And if he wishes me to know myself, let him also take away from me my knowledge of myself. For otherwise, I cannot have it at all. Uh, anyway, so playing with these apophatic themes here and then the, the near far, the blessed trinity, a sense of nearness to him, a sense of farness, um, transcendent, imminent. Love says this, now this soul says love has her true name from the nothingness in which she dwells. And since she is nothing, she is concerned for nothing, not for herself or for her neighbors or for God himself. This holy indifference, right? For she is so little that she cannot find herself. And every created thing is so far from her that she cannot sense it. And God is so great that she can comprehend nothing of him. And on account of this nothingness, she has reached the certainty of knowing nothing. 
and of wishing for nothing. And this nothing of which we speak, says love, gives her, gives her everything. And in no way other can anyone have it. The nada gives her the toto. This soul, says love, is imprisoned and held in the land of complete peace, for she is at all times in complete satisfaction, where she swims and eddies and floats and ebbs in divine peace, without any emotion from her inner being, without any outward exertion. So we, we see this ideal of surrender um, to the Lord, and that's where your peace is found, right? Our peace is in God's will, the surrender to his will. But we do, she is getting a bit too passive uh, as, she, as she describes that. Um, okay, just one more. And then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, and just this mystery of love. How love has different modes and shows itself in different ways. The soul says, Now you have heard, heard certain considerations, says the soul, which I pondered so as to unburden myself and find the way. I thought upon them when I was forlorn, you know, forlorn or you know, desolation or abandoned. I thought upon them when I was forlorn, that is, when I was distraught, for all those are forlorn who have some affection of the spirit. And these considerations belong to the life of the spirit through the affection experience and that tenderness of love which the soul has for herself. But she believes that it is for God that she has this love with which she is so smitten. Right, so oftentimes our affectionate love, what we think is our uh, love for God is actually love for self. <laughs> affectionate um, consolation with him. But she believes that it is for God that she has this love with which she is so smitten. But in truth, it is herself that she loves without her knowing and perceiving this. And so those who love are deceived by the tenderness of their affection, which prevents them from ever coming to true knowledge and true love. And so they're like children who remain occupied in childish works. And so they will remain so long as they have affection of the spirit. Or they're living too much by affections or emotions. And here divine love speaks. Ah, God says divine love. So divine love, I guess here is, is your personified love and it's something other than God because divine love is speaking to God. Ah, God says divine love, taking its rest in the soul brought to nothing. How long away, how great a distance it is from such a life forlorn, forlorn to a life set free of which life set free wishing for nothing is, is overlord. And this wishing for nothing sows the divine seed taken from within the divine will. This seed can never fail, but there are few men who dispose themselves to receive such seed. I have found many who have become lost in the affection of the spirit through works of virtue and the longing of a good will. But I have found few who were nobly forlorn, nobly, um, you know, dealing with desolation. And to be sure, I have found fewer still who are free, that is, who live a life set free, and who are such as this book asks for. That is, who have one single will, which perfect love makes them to have. Nothing else but love. For perfect love makes them to have one love and one will, and so my will has become a wishing for nothing. And such a love, which is so uniquely perfect, being of divine making, comes from God. Such a soul is naked, and so in her nakedness, she has no care whether the serpent bite her. Eh. <laughs> and just as God cannot increase his joy, so also that of the soul cannot be moved or increased by her doing, but only if the work is done by God. If there were to move by means of her own doing, she would be concerned with herself in doing this. And if she is naked, such a state cannot be. And then finally, the soul that is free says, this is true, says the soul that is free. And I have attained to the state through a perfect abandonment of self. For miracles are because of faith, and such miracles give me true knowledge of the divine gifts, and it is faith which causes this. Um, so yeah, so anyways, we have this ideal of this perfect advantage to God, this freedom of spirit, and that does lead to a heresy of the brethren of the free spirit who kind of go too far in these kind of directions. Um, it's a forerunner of, of the quietist as well. So anyways... We can see what she's up to, but um, she does take things too far. But she does leave her mark on Meister Eckhart, which leaves its mark on uh, Eckhart, or uh, Toller and Suso, which we'll treat next time we're together, I hope, three months from now or so. So it's good background for them. And just to appreciate this interplay between the friars and these Beguines, and how it's not simply the friars influencing the Beguines, but the Beguines also influence the friars, 
And the friars, especially Collar and Suso, do a good job of taking what's best in these sentiments and these movements of the heart and spirit, uh, taking what's best from them and then expressing them in, in more orthodox and better uh, language. So, okay, so any uh, questions or, or comments? Yeah. Uh, so this language of abyss, yeah. darkness, uh, is this something that comes from, I don't know, New Plato or somewhere? Mm. Oh, interesting. So where, where is this coming from? Because uh, in Chi Asian China, uh, yeah. the, the ideal is almost something similar, but you don't find such language when it describes similar things. So I was just wondering where it comes from. Yeah, right. Right. Um, so Gregor of Nyssa, so the Cappadocian father from like the 300s, um, he speaks about a glowing darkness. And so he used this uh, Moses as an example of the, the ideal one who contemplates. So he has a book called uh, The Ascent of, or no, uh, The Life of Moses. And a lot of this is how Moses encounters God in the darkness. He encounters God in the darkness as he climbs up the mountain. And that's the model for all contemplatives, to encounter God in the darkness. Um, so the Cappadocian fathers um, develop this theme. And from Gregory of Nyssa, he influences three people who kind of push this theme forward. And then it gets taken up into the rest of the tradition. Uh, Vagrius is influenced by Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocian fathers. Pseudo-Dionysius is influenced by Gregor of Nyssa. And from Pseudo-Dionysius, this language gets, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas has um, a commentary on the divine names of Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, and then John of Cross um, is influenced by Pseudo-Dionysius as well. Um, and then the other one is Pseudo-Macarius in his homilies that um, Gregor of Nyssa influences. Um, so that's a key place in Christian tradition, uh, this language of darkness. But again, for them, for Gregor of Nyssa, it's a glowing darkness. It's a darkness that's because of an excess of light. So Pseudo-Dionysius uses the image of a bat that's blinded in the sunlight because of too much light. I think that's from Aristotle, actually, mm. as well. And so, again, so the Cappadocian father, these two are influenced by Neoplatonic thought. Um, so maybe they are using some of um, the language and ideas of the Neoplatonists. Um, but on the other hand, my claim would be that um, this talk is, is scriptural. It's in the Bible. And so what I mean by that is precisely the life of Moses. Um, they encounter, he encounters God in the cloud, the dark cloud, and right, I don't think the sacred authors were just giving us the weather report of that day, that it was cloudy. That cloud, I mean, if you want to capture in symbols, if you want to capture an encounter with God who is mysterious, God is who I am, who I am, you can't see my face, you can only see my back. You know, that's one way to capture it. <laughs> this most mysterious encounter with God is, okay, you can't see my face, you can only see my back. Uh, that suggests something of hiddenness. And then um, encountering the Lord in the, the, the storm cloud and the cloud, that darkness, um, <laughs> and the thunder clasp <laughs> uh, is going to be another way to express that mysterious encounter with God. Um, I think there really was a cloud on Mount Sinai, but I, you know, it, it's there also to kind of um, capture this encounter with the mysterious God. So I think uh, using Neoplatonic concepts uh, to kind of open up this idea of this encounter with God um, that's a glowing darkness. Um, I think it helps bring out what's already there in the Bible. So and then, then the Mount of the Transfiguration, I want to start over. So Matthew 17, 5, the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a cloud that overshadows them. So you, you kind of think of darkness when you think of cloud. But uh, Matthew says it's a bright cloud. Uh, so we're back to that language of Gregor and Nyssa. Uh, or no, no, we're back. Well, yeah. Uh, the glowing darkness. It's a darkness because of excess of light. Kind of this mysterious knowing by unknowing. 
Um, yeah, it's where uh, God takes us beyond our own, beyond the limits of our concepts through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and brings us to that divine mode of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, where we have a tasting of God, experiential knowledge of God based on charity, a deeper penetration of the mystery uh, through the gift of understanding. Okay. Is, is it Paul who said that we are no longer like, approaching God in darkness, but no matter Yeah, what right. Like yeah, yeah. And so potentially there could be another way of interpreting the bright cloud as like just bright, even that's without bright. darkness. Yep. No, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, so there is a way in which the life of faith brings us from darkness into the light. Mm-hmm. You know, so there is, you know, faith is light. The light of faith uh, brings us from the, the, the place of darkness. Um, but there is also a way in which faith is not yet seen, right? Uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. And so um, faith compared to the be, to beatific vision as a sense of not yet, uh, a darkness, a hiddenness. Um, so, okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it depends on, uh, and you know, today we had the readings from Ephesians um, 4, 5, 4, 5, not 5, um, about walk as children of light, you are children of light. So yeah, so, we'll, so certainly in the, okay, so we'll put it this way. Um, I think even, so in the scriptural tradition, so another example, think about uh, when the temple is dedicated and that cloud fills the temple and the priests are no longer able to minister. And so the glory cloud of God comes into that temple. The priests are kind of left in this um, doing nothing. They're no longer able to do their work. The storm cloud, you know, the, the cloud fills the temple uh, there is something like that's getting at this deep encounter with God as well, this contemplation where the, the activity is stilled and you're entering into that silence, bowed before the majesty of God. So there, there's that in, in the Bible. But I would say this theme of light and darkness, the Bible emphasizes more the light, which is, I think, your point, Sister Jalan. Um, and then... In the Christian tradition, thinkers like the Cappadocian Fathers um, and Pseudo Dionysius and John of the Cross and these Beguines, kind of a, an emphasis on the, the dark uh, kind of comes in more than the Bible. So, right, but we do have to remember, you know, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Uh, yet we have all those Psalms. You know, he has made darkness his raiment. Um, we have a lot of psalms that, you know, God has made darkness in the cloud, his raiment. And so the, the psalms, too, also capture, you know, like uh, Moses on the mountain, like the priest in the temple who can't minister anymore because the cloud has come in. Um, the psalms suggest uh, this kind of um, place of encountering God in the darkness as well, and the hiddenness uh, through faith uh, alone. Still small voice in a way, uh, gets at that. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's cataphatic and apophatic. Cataphatic emphasizes more knowledge of God that we do have. Apophatic emphasizes more that God is the, the beyond uh, all this. Um, and so, yeah, you can emphasize one or the other more. And I think, yeah, scripture. Um, there's both, but it is kind of the light talk, I'd say, predominates. And that, you know, that's, if we want to lean in that direction, that's good too. <laughs> St. Bernard, he ends his Song of Songs homily. He doesn't end it deliberately, but his last word that he wrote before he died and uh, it remained incomplete was live as children of light, uh, which is the, the first reading from today. And so in Bernard, there is desolation, there's consolation, but I think also in Bernard, there is kind of an accent on the brightness and uh, live as children of light, and, uh, the light of God. So that's a fine accent to have. But to uh, appreciate in your own spiritual life, uh, that, you know, there is kind of, there, there's this other side too. Um, yeah. Um. 
So for Angela Foligno, it seems like the Carmelites really picked her up a lot yeah. more so than others. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on why that's the case. Because, you know, she was a Franciscan, but the Carmelites seem to... And I was actually first introduced to her by reading Divine Intimacy because she's quoted a lot in there. Right. And, and, you know, there's little parts at the ends of each day where it has little quotes from the saints. And I kept reading her. I was like, who is this person? Um, but then, you know, from that, but then also you had said, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, you know, refers to her, you know, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And so, do you know, like, what is so attractive particularly about her or themes that she uses that are that are really kind of conducive to Carmelite spirituality? Yeah, interesting question. Um, yeah, so we just, so we know that there are her, her texts of her works, you know, they end up in Spain in the 16th century, so accessible to Teresa of Avila. They end up in fr uh, France, the 17th century, and so then the French Carmelites uh, kind of uh, have access to her then. So I don't know all the details of how that came about, why they were kind of brought there. Um, or how that happened, the dissimulation of the text, dissemination of the text in that way. Um, okay, but as far as what's attractive, um, so you know, I, I do think, um, so I would just say that more than strictly Carmelite, um, I would say it's, it's a, she's attractive to contemplatives, uh, people who live the contemplative life more exclusively because of this theme of the double abyss and our own poverty and and God's overwhelming abundance, um, that it, it rings true with people who spend a, a lot of time in, in prayer. Um, and I'll give us some of the similar, the apophatic themes. Uh, you know, Angela says, you know, every time I say something of God, I, I feel like I have to say I'm a liar, because it's not true what I said. <laughs> So I would just say it's, it's more that um, contemplatives are attracted to her to spend people who spend a lot of time in prayer because um, we wrestle with these things more and they come to the fore more and she gives kind of a, a way of expressing that and kind of entering into it or thinking about it. So, yeah. Also, I mean, that in the midst of all that, you know, there's the incarnation for Angela Foligno, that's front and center. So that's one of the things that I mentioned that is a, a striking thing about her. Mostly when people tend towards apophaticism in a strong way, it means kind of the incarnation is less stressed. Because um, right in the incarnation, we do have, in a way, a direct um, encounter with God, a direct knowing of God. Right, it's the divine son. It's his human nature that he speaks to us um, through. He acts out in our presence in you know, our human history. Um, so it's, you know, so oftentimes when people go apathetic, they tend to stress less the incarnation. You know, so like the cloud of unknowing uh, by the English um, could be an English Carthusian. I like that theory the best. Oh yeah, we don't know who the author is. Uh, but he goes strong in the apophatic direction. And th there are references to the incarnation, but it's, it's less stressed. Uh, but Angela Foligno uh, keeps the incarnation of Jesus Christ at the center while going in the apophatic direction. And so I think that appeals to the Carmelites too, and you know, other Christian contemplatives, but the Carmelites, you know, the Tresian reform, you know, Jesus is so important and keeping him at the center. So that's probably another reason um, that she's attractive, attractive uh, to Carmelites, but also to other uh, Catholic contemplatives. I have a question. Um, you mentioned about Mina being yeah. like a feminine pronoun, and even before you said that, I was wondering, like, why Padaway? Even I mean, it's harder for me to like delve into writing that talks about like these attributes of God and feminine like yeah. pronouns, I yeah. guess. Like even like the book of wisdom is hard for me to like get into. Like right. wisdom is a she. Yeah. So I was wondering, do you think she purposely chose like do you know if there is a masculine noun? Like or is that just 
you know? Oh, right. Like, could she have chosen to write in masculine terms, or did she choose? Yeah, a little rusty on my middle Dutch. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, yeah. I was thinking, um, you said Mechtilde uses the same word. Oh, that's good in the German, I, I think, right. I think it's a, a diminutive as well, oh. so I think it's a term of endearment. Hmm. I mean, I'm not positive, right. but I think, I mean, I've studied a little bit of German, and, I, and as I saw it, I think, um, ah. like in high German, it was seen as like, a term of endearment towards someone wow. as opposed to like just like love it was like what you would say to the one you like loved in this very particular way wow. so it's like I think in this case at least what I thought about it is it's like it's kind of taking to oneself this kind of like a very close and tender way to love as opposed to just being like patent just the pure passion or something like that exactly. but I mean I'm not I'm not positive but from my very limited thoughts on, on like high German, I think that might be something. No, that's so helpful. Yeah, that's more German than I know, and that it rings it rings true. It makes sense. Um, I mean, Julian of Norwich, she's someone too, who kind of emphasizes the maternal um, side of God. Okay, yeah, so whether they had a choice here, yeah, I don't, yeah. So what? Um, how else? Angela or Hadwick? Um, and Mechtil, what other terms they do use and could have used, um, and whether it's intention, you know, they're certainly not like engaging in our current, you know, more modern <laughs> <laughs> inclusive language or something. That's like not on their uh, radar screen. They're not concerned about that. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, you know, um, what's that? It's just harder to enter yeah. into. You know, I mean, God is beyond <laughs> gender, of course, um, and you know, Jesus does you know speak about God as the hen, you know, gathering um, the chicks under his wings, um, and you know, in Isaiah, we know those passages. You know, God's love is more tender than the mother's. If the mother, you know, could forget her thought, you know, baby, so God would forget you, that kind of thing. Um, so there is that, so, you know, but God is beyond gender, beyond, um, the sexes, but on the other hand, right, I mean, God does reveal himself as father, uh, so we want to maintain that. Um, no, if this frustrates you, um, <laughs> <laughs> Robert, Robert Barron, um, before he was Bishop Robert Barron, one of his early books is on St. Thomas Aquinas spiritual master and it's really good but he you know he's right in the 90s I think and he's kind of in academia um, and so he he does kind of go this route of wanting to use inclusive so sometimes he refers to God as he sometimes he refers to God as she uh, throughout the text uh, and it's it's annoying um, and but it, it's it's yeah it's it's too bad that because it's a good it, he makes a lot of good points and it is rich to kind of open up St. Thomas uh, to like people who aren't going to spend years uh, studying Aristotle and the scholastics and entering the scholastic um, framework. It's it's great. Um, it's a great book, but it's kind of it's it's hard to read because of that. Um, so um, it could be worse. <laughs> so, um, do men experience a courtly love? God knows Oh wow. <laughs> Good, yeah, a good question. <laughs> so this, this, <laughs> so that's a, a question we have to we, we hit directly when we go to Blessed Henry Suso, because mm -hmm. he's big in the courtly love motif and he goes with it. And so, how does he deal with that? Well, um, it's it's wisdom. God has wisdom that he has this marriage with this spiritual marriage with uh, with wisdom with Lady Wisdom. Who has, um, who's divine. I mean, there are, have you seen these images or sketches? I don't know if he drew them or people around his time, but there are depictions of like, yeah, this, his marriage with a lady wisdom. And yeah, it's, uh, depicts God as having both masculine and feminine, um, attributes, which is a little odd. Um, <laughs> so yeah, do men, that's, a, I mean, it's, um, or John on the Cross, I mean, spiritual marriage, so it's not so much the courtly love motif, 
but it is big in Jala Cross, you know, spiritual marriage and the bridegroom and the Song of Songs. Um, so I think what's important here um, for men, but also for women as well. So for John of the Cross, um, anyway, so I, I find it helpful to divine bridegroom, to make sure, you know, the, just even adding the word divine helps me to relate to the Lord as bridegroom in kind of this spiritual marriage type way, divine bridegroom. Um, but then in John of the Cross, he's so radical, severe, and kind of the purification of images of God. You've got to move beyond it, move beyond it, um, into almost an abstract place. Um, and so to find this uh, spiritual marriage, love type language through that purification of concepts and ideas in kind of that almost abstract place, so to speak, you know, drawn away from the, the senses or the sensual. Um, I mean, that, that, that helps as you read, read like Song of Songs and some of this language, or like Mechtile, where she goes strong in the erotic language. It does help to kind of find that on a different level uh, than uh, simply like the bodily. Um, so John of the Cross, you know, you do see that strong, intimate, spiritual marriage type love there, and it does shape him, but it's clearly on a higher plane uh, than just the sensual. Um, and so how men deal with the courtly love kind of thing, I guess that's, that's one way to... Well, even to like, I don't know about John of the Cross, but like Bernard would refer to like the soul is she and so it's this right. kind of similar question for me is that like just a language thing because in latin that would have been anima which is a feminine noun so right. soul becomes she and so he can easily talk about you know the nuptials with the word as if she she the soul and he the word you know exactly yeah, so Even the, though he's like a man talking about that, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, so it's the receptivity of the soul that's kind of highlighted too when we speak about the soul as she, the receptivity uh, of the soul. Um, but yeah, no, it is, uh, any, any other insights or opinions on this? Because it is an interesting question. And on that, it's um, young, you know, like college age students who are like serious about the faith and are like pursuing the spiritual life and they read these texts. Um, yeah, it's, it's not uncommon to hear, get questions from them along these lines. Like, yeah, how do they incorporate this? Should they? Or how do they? Um, and it is, um, yeah, so I'm my stock answer what I said about John McCross like finding it on a higher level um, and it, I'm a song of songs I alluded to this but I wasn't clear so you, if you got to even pick up on it but um, instead of seeing song of songs as the literal sense is kind of this um, this just courtly love kind of language um, and draw from like secular sources so to speak and then it's applied to God later by the tradition that's common kind of the common story um but there's another account of things that no the primary sense of song of songs is that it's an allegory of the soul and god or the people of god and, and god you know or both um and so it's not that the little sense of the text is about uh, human love and human marriage and then later a spiritual sense of the text is uh, it's applied to the soul and god uh, which is kind of the modern exegesis, contemporary exegesis kind of goes that dir direction. Um, but it's rather that um, as an included in the, the canon of scripture, that the, the literal sense of, of the, the text uh, is about the soul and God, the people of Israel and in God. And that for pe readers of Song of Songs from like the patristics, because it's commented on a lot uh, from the patristics through like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. 
um, like all this human element of things um, just doesn't enter the picture. Like they can't see it, but in relation to, between God and the soul. And so, um, you know, problems that people fall into today, like oh, I read Song of Songs and I feel tempted <laughs> as I read Song of Songs or something. Um, it seems like it wasn't an issue in the past because like it was, was they it was hard for them to just see it in any other way as, you know, the, the, the story of the soul and, and God. You know, so Francis de Sales, you know, he's 17 and he studies Song of Songs in Paris, France, you know, the city of love. And the 17 year old there is studying the Song of Songs. Um, and it's like, it's no issue for him. Um, it's, uh, then his treatise on divine love that like he writes, you know, takes up, you know, he, it's all about Song of Songs and he draws it. Uh, but there's like no, hardly any question. Um, about other ways of reading it. I mean, I guess the church fathers like Origen and Gregor Nyssa have, you know, they do have things. Well, make sure you read this in the right spirit and don't read this in a carnal way. Um, so concerns like that are expressed. Um, but I think it was less of a problem for them for them because they did see it primarily as this allegory uh, of the soul's love for God and God's love for the soul. St. Thomas says, what am I trying to think? Um, so, you know, so you have the will and kind of the emotions. And, you know, God doesn't have emotions. He has will. But there is something about, I forget how Thomas puts it, but there is kind of an analogy between pure will and kind of the emotions. And so that what we experience as emotions does get at the richness of the life of, of spirit, of pure will, pure spirit. You know, although it's experienced by us most readily um, in a bodily way, an emotional way, um, that that texture of love that we experience emotionally and bodily, that texture of love, um, that richness, that texture, um, is still, you know, a purely spiritual act, you know, pure will, pure spirit has that same richness and texture. So in God, the richness of, and the texture of like human love and married love, um, that does capture something about pure spirit, pure love, a pure will, even though, even with God not having a body. Um, and so then as we, we think about God, and we approach him, that all these things um, can be alive and, and active, but you know, purified of the excesses, purified of what, what doesn't belong to God and elevated. And it does, does give us access uh, to, to God and his love uh, and, and his will, um, that it does have this richness in this texture. And it's not you know, the German uh, philo philosophical, you know, just obligated to do this or that. Um, so... Do you remember where Aquinas might have written this? Yeah, so... Um, Maybe you could send it to us. Yeah. So I think it, it's when he's... I think it's when he's speaking about the passions. I mean, it's interesting because he does speak about the affection of charity. So this, you know, question 43 of the Invisible Missions. Um, he speaks about the affection of charity there. Um, yeah, no, you know, so, okay, so it's, um, the affection at life, and what does he call, what the will is rational desire. You know, so you have desire, which is, um, you know, you have the concupiscible passions, the irascible passions. You have desire, which is, is sensual, but then, uh, desire, which is for material things. Uh, and what is the will? Well, the will is rational desire. So it's not like, you know, uh, the will is and desire and uh, the sensual are like in two different areas or two di are totally unrelated. Um, but the will is, is but the, the rational desire, rational affectivity. Um, but no, I can't, but I, I think somewhere in the passion where he's talking about, um, anyways, I'll see if I can find the, the quotation.
Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, God chose to use the image of human marriage to talk about his love for his people. And it, it's not that, you know, and this just comes to a new high point, right? Ephesians 5. And he spoke about Christ and the church. Um, the two become one. Um, yeah, and so that, that does express something about God's, uh, so human love does express something about, you know, God's purely spiritual love for us. And it does give us access to contours and colors and texture and richness of that. Anything else? Be better lying down. Okay. All right. So let's um, let's end with a little prayer. I just yeah, I want to end just on a, just with the text, and then I'll go into prayer. So this is from Angela Foligno, the seventh supplementary step. My soul has just been elevated to a state of joy so great that it's totally unspeakable. I can say nothing about it. In this state, I knew everything I wanted to know and possessed all I wanted to possess. I saw the all good. She also added, in this state, the soul can never even think of the withdrawal of this good or about withdrawing from this good or that it might ever have to be separated from it from then on. For the soul finds all its delight in this all good. Furthermore, the soul sees absolutely nothing that the lips or even the heart could afterwards speak about. It sees nothing and everything at once. Continuing to speak in this way, she said, Henceforth, there is no good which could be described or even conceived in which I can place my hope. My hope rather lies in this secret good, one most certain and hidden, that I understand is accompanied with such darkness." As I, Brother Scribe, resisted what she said about this darkness and did not understand her, Christ's faith one told me by way of explanation, the all good was all the more certain and superior to everything, the more it was seen in darkness and most secret. That is why I see the all good accompanied with darkness, because it surpasses every good. All else in comparison is but darkness. No matter how far the soul or heart expands itself, all that expanse is less than this good. What I related until now, that is, when the soul sees all creation overflowing with God's presence, when it sees the divine power or the divine wisdom, all of which Christ faithful had said she had already seen in such marvelous and indescribable ways, all this is inferior to this most secret good, because this good which I see with darkness is the whole, and all other things are but parts. When God is seen in darkness, it does not bring a smile to the lips, nor devotion, nor fervor, or ardent love, nor does she see the body or the soul tremble or move, but at other times, the soul sees nothing and sees everything. The body sleeps and speech is cut off, and all the signs of friendship, so numerous and indescribable, all the words which God spoke to me, all those which you ever wrote, I now understand that they were so much less than that which I see with such great darkness, that in no way do I place my hope in them nor is there any of my hope in them. Even if it were possible that all these previous experiences were not true, nonetheless, that could in no way diminish my hope. The hope that is so secure and certain is in the all good, which I see with such darkness. And then she says about an encounter with Jesus Christ, just uh, the next page. When I am in that darkness, I do, not, I do not remember anything about anything human or the God-man or anything which has form. Nevertheless, I see all and I see nothing. As what I have spoken of withdraws and stays with me, I see the God-man. He draws my soul with great gentleness and he sometimes says to me, you are I and I am you. I see then those eyes and that face so gracious and attractive as he leans to embrace me. In short, what proceeds from those eyes and that face is what I said that I saw in that previous darkness, which comes from within, and which delights me so that I can say nothing about it. When I am in the God-man, my soul is alive. 
Lord Jesus Christ, uh, help us to find in you that indescribable good, that indescribable love that you, God, are in your mystery. Help us to move from meditation on you in your life, the practice of the sacraments, uh, to this, to those wordless encounters with you in the darkness, mingled with light. Help us to find you, Lord, in that secret and hidden place um, and abide there with you until we dwell with you in pure light, happiness, and bliss. And we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom come, come. thy Thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Mother. Yeah.